Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Uh, thank you for making the effort to travel to Luxembourg to be with us on this historical day for us. Thank you also to the people who are following us online. Um, I will moderate this press conference. We will have statements from uh, our guests. And after the statements, there will be the possibility to ask questions. Um, and after that, if you want, we can also do one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, for that. So I will pass the floor to the European Chief Prosecutor, Laura Kövesi. Good morning to all of you. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start thanking to our special guests that are today with us for their uh, help and for their support to build the first European Public Prosecutor Office. They represent the European Parliament, the Council, the European Commission and the host uh, state. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a historic moment. Today, the European Public Prosecutor Office is taking up its duties. We are no longer dreaming about the future. We are making it happen. After more than two decades of legal discussions, followed by difficult political negotiations, we took less than two years for practical preparation. This is it. So, today, it's not about an extraordinary legal text. It is about those who have to make it work. We have an enormous responsibility. There is no precedent for a European Public Prosecutor Office. Our decisions will directly affect the fundamental rights of European citizens. We are the first really sharp tool to defend the rule of law in the EU. Our success is a matter of credibility for our union. We have a complex structure, a central level with 15 permanent chambers in which different combination of 22 European prosecutors and myself will take key decisions in thousands of cases each year. We have decentralized offices for altogether 140 European delegated prosecutors using different equipment, technologies, methods and languages. We are a single office operating under 22 different criminal procedural regimes. This has never been attempted before. Our target, economic and financial criminality. Make no mistake, this is the most common threat to any democratic society. It is underreported, underestimated, often even tolerated to the benefit of organized criminal organizations that aspire to subvert and replace legitimate authorities. Ultimately, this is whom we are going to be dealing with. People who do not shy away from extreme violence to secure their impunity. This is why the independence of the EPPO is vital. Only an independent judiciary can enforce the law equally for everybody. We have a unique competence, we have great powers, we have so much potential. With EPPO, our union can enforce one of its fundamental principles. By protecting the European Union's budget, we will play an essential role in making the European citizens' trust in the union stronger than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to start. One thing is sure. This would not have been possible without the incredible enthusiasm, dedication, and professionalism of the EPPO team. Thanks to them, as from today, there is a simple address where to report suspicious of fraud for the EU budget, the EPPO. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer to your question after the speeches of distinguished guests. Ms. Van Dunen. morning. This is a historical day. It was said already. The start of the EPPO operations is a very significant achievement, which comes at the hands of a long process, which has enabled to set up the office started after the adoption of the EPPO regulation in October 19. Uh, to, uh, 2017. When I took office as Minister for Justice in 2015, I firmly embraced this project since the first day I conveyed Portugal's support in negotiations on the, the regulation and the way at that time. The adoption of the regulation is a milestone in the European Union criminal justice. A new stage in criminal justice began in the EU, which has now its own body for criminal prosecution against fraud and other crimes jeopardizing the EU financial interests. This is a journey that began in 1995 with the Convention on the Protection of the European Community's Financial Interests, until the approval of Directive 2017-1391, a legal instrument that together with the national transposition of, law, of laws set up the framework for the EPPO action. The creation of the EPPO is thus the culmination of an approximation contributing to the strengthening and consolidation of an European area of freedom, security, and justice based on the mutual recognition of judicial decisions. The Portuguese presidency and the council attaches particular importance to the full operationalization of the EPPO, which was one of the top priorities of the program of the president, president for the semester. I would like to recall the active role played by the Council in the framework of the tasks to put the EPPO regulation and to support the setting up of the EPPO. In particular, the appointment jointly with the European Parliament of the European Chief Prosecutor, and afterwards, the appointment of the national prosecutors. The conditions for the EPPO to begin at work are met. Creating these conditions has required a considerable effort on the part of the Union and of the participating member states, the 22 participating member states. We hold European institutions, national governments and public opinion have high expectations of the work of the European Public Prosecution Office. I'm sure that all prosecutors working in this institution are aware of the difficulty they will face, but I'm also confident that they are, they are completely prepared to reach the purposes for which the EPPO has been created. The start of the operations comes at a very critical moment for the protection of the financial interests of the European Union, 
in particular have in regard the next generation EU, which will allow to grant to its member states significant financial resources to recover from pandemic. Let me reaffirm the continuous support of the Presidency of the Council to the EPPO as its in, and its interests in closely following its activities. A regular and fruitful dialogue between the EPPO and the national judiciary authorities should be implemented to allow the office to successfully perform its duties. The Portuguese presidency and myself are fully committed with the success of your work, Madame Covetti. Thank you. Dear ladies and uh, gentlemen, I am, of course, uh, very pleased to participate today um, to the launch of the EPPO's operations, um, not only because um, today's ceremony marks the end of a long journey and the beginning of a new and hopefully successful adventure, but of course also because um, Luxembourg is hosting this, um, this body. The um, creation of the EPPO it took uh, more than 20 years, from the Tampere Decla Declaration in 1999, deciding to strengthen the mutual recognition of judicial decisions and judgments and the approximation of legislation, until today. One of the findings at the center of Tampere decisions was that the objective to fight certain forms of crime cannot be dealt only at national level, due to the cross-border nature of those forms of crime and the need for a coordinated response and could possibly be better achieved at union level. And this is still or even more true today. The realization of this large-scale project obviously implies that a fundamental aspect of national sovereignty will be transferred to a European authority. And this is precisely what made the negotiation process in the Council between 2013 and 2017 extremely difficult. It has been a bumpy road, and we were at one point even close to failure. Very challenging years of negotiation and implementation are behind us. EPPO is becoming finally a reality by bringing together, for the time being, 22 member states. We will obviously continue to promote the participation of as many member states as possible. We have undoubtedly taken a fundamental and historic step in the integration of the European judicial area, because the European Public Prosecutor's Office will be a new kind of union body and will adopt a novel approach to the fight against cross-border crime. The creation of the EPPO generates multiple expectations, ranging from a more rapid initiation of investigations through a timely reporting of criminal conduct and an improved conduct of cross-border investigations to a more consistently applied anti-fraud strategy within the member states. Even the more important it was that we have created a strongly independent prosecution office to cope with all kinds of possible pressures. I wanted to thank Madame Covesi and her entire team for their tireless efforts in the last months and wish them all the best in assuming their tasks. And I was very happy to, to meet them um, before and see how motivated they all are to, um, to start working uh, as of today. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got it. I am convinced historians of the EU will mark the 1st of June 2021 in bold in their books. And they should. This is an extraordinary achievement for the European Union and for the public. This is a great day for the European taxpayers because today we are giving them a very clear assurance that we will protect their money better. 
The establishment of the EPPO and the launch of its activities have been a top priority for the Commission in the last years. I spent my previous mandate of the Commissioner for Justice convincing the Member States to join the supranational body. And this has not always been easy. At the beginning, we only had 14 Member States. Today, we have 22 participating countries with one more, hopefully ready to join soon. We can safely say that the EPPO is a truly European body. And I am also very happy that Madame Laura Koveshi is our first European public prosecutor. I am convinced she has all it takes to launch the EPPO, find and prosecute fraudsters. The EPPO is a brand new body in the architecture of the European Union. Even more, it is a unique body. No existing EU office or agency can prosecute fraudsters. EPPO will fill important gap in our system of protecting the EU funds. There were almost 1,000 incidents of reported fraudulent irregularities in 2019. Their value is estimated for 460 million euro. The stakes are particularly high because with the EU recovery fund and the EU budget, we will reach a record high figure and no euro should be wasted to fraud, especially in such difficult times. And the EPPO will not be alone in these endeavours. There is also Anti-Fraud Office, OLAF, there is Eurojust and Europol. Together with the EPPO, they all will have the role to play to keep Europe safe and free from fraud. I also hope that the EPPO will not only be a game changer in the fight against fraud, but will also contribute to protecting and enhancing the respect for the rule of law across Europe. In this regard, the input of the new office will be of crucial importance in the framework of the recently adopted regulation on a general regime of rule of law conditionality for the protection of the union budget because the EPPO will be in an ideal position to share with the Commission any information it may come across in its activities that reveals deficiencies or breaches of the rule of law in the participating member states. In sum, as of today, taxpayers' money will be better protected. So I want to congratulate Madame Koveshi, all the European prosecutors and staff, Congratulations and good luck. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, this day has come. So, we are celebrating today the start of the operation of the uh, European Public Prosecutor Office, and it's an important day, of course, for the European Union. And I want to say that I'm very happy as Commissioner for Justice to be here in Luxembourg on this occasion, together with uh, the colleagues uh, near from the European Court of Justice and the Tribunal, so the place to be for the European Justice is maybe uh, more and more Luxembourg. And so first, uh, I would like to thank and congratulate the Chief Prosecutor, Mrs. Covesi, dear Laura, and uh, the European Prosecutors for the admirable work they have done in setting up the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Sans oublier, bien sûr, les autorités luxembourgeoises qui ont accueilli le parquet européen sur leur sol et, je le disais, font ainsi de leur pays la capitale judiciaire de l'Europe. L'entrée en fonction du parquet européen est une étape tant essentielle qu'historique dans l'évolution de l'intégration européenne. Essentielle car le parquet européen a pour mission de protéger le budget européen, un budget sans lequel les politiques de l'Union européenne ne seraient que l'ombre d'elles-mêmes, historique, car c'est la première fois qu'une grande majorité d'États membres partagent leur pouvoir régalien en matière de droit pénal en faveur du budget de l'Union européenne. Cela nous a permis de nous doter d'un tout premier parquet européen habilité à poursuivre et traduire en justice en toute indépendance les auteurs d'infractions portant atteinte au budget de l'Union européenne. Euh, 
les chiffres liés à la fraude parlent d'eux-mêmes et justifient pleinement l'existence du parquet européen. Pour la seule année 2019, le montant de la fraude au budget européen tel que rapporté par les États membres s'élevait à 500 millions d'euros, ou aux alentours de 500 millions d'euros. Il est d'autant plus urgent et capital de compter sur l'action du parquet européen, alors que l'économie européenne va bientôt être dotée d'un budget très important pour la relance économique post-Covid. Nous avons entendu cet appel et nous y avons répondu. Ces fonds du Next Generation EU ne doivent évidemment servir que les intérêts de l'économie et des citoyens européens. And this is why the um, EPPO's mission to protect the EU budget is crucial and deserves our full support. Mrs. Covesi and her team can rely on the Commission's support to fulfill their activities efficiently. Ultra full independent, the EPPO is a story of European collaboration. 22 member states have joined in uh, the enhanced cooperation. In Luxembourg, They are represented by one European prosecutor each. At the national level, at least two national prosecutors will conduct investigations which the central office based in Luxembourg will supervise in all independence. The central office will also be in an ideal position to coordinate the investigations in complex cross-border cases such as serious VIT uh, carousel uh, fraud. And thanks to this uh, structure, the EPPO will achieve the best of both worlds. The strong European impulse given to investigations will be combined with the day-to-day -day activities at national level. To date, five member states have decided to remain outside the enhanced cooperation. I would like to remind them that they are welcome to join the EPPO anytime. We stand ready to support them in the process of joining the enhanced cooperation. In the meantime, those countries have to keep in mind that the protection of the union budget is not of concern to the participating member states only. It requires the common effort of all EU member states. I would add that cooperation is everyone's business in the EU, including that of our citizens. With the EPPO, citizens will be able to report, like it was said by the Chief Prosecutor, any criminal activities to the office too. It will play a part in curbing crime in Europe. The protection of the Union's financial interests does not and must not stop at the borders of the EU. The trail of fraud and money laundering often leads us to jurisdictions in our immediate vicinity and beyond. This is why the PPO has to create and nurture close bonds with the competent authorities of the participating member states, as well as those of the non-participating member states and third countries. Here again, the European Commission will do its utmost to help the office strengthen its position beyond EU borders through robust cooperation with uh, authorities in third countries. Fighting fraud today requires a powerful institution equipped to cast its net wide across border and beyond. It may still be early days, but I'm confident that today's launch of the Open Public Prosecutor Office is the only one and best way forward. And I count on the participating member states to conclude in some case the legislative process to implement the regulation on the PPO in their national legislation And I count also on some member states to uh, complete or to start the appointment of the uh, European delegate prosecutors because it's very important to be equipped in all the participating member states in the near future. But uh, I'm very pleased that we have the opportunity to start the operations uh, today. So congratulations not only to the chief prosecutor but to the staff in Luxembourg, to the College of Prosecutors and to all the uh, EDPs at work at the national level because since some hours now, You have received the first case, so you will have to start the discussion with your colleagues about those first uh, cases coming in here in Luxembourg. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? So, uh, first question is to the Chief Prosecutor. My name is Shandor Jivers from Euronews. Uh, what is the 
room for, for maneuver from your organization when we see that already some countries that join the prosecutor's office are trying to block in a way your work and other interesting uh, countries are not even uh, uh, want to work with you. They are saying that this is against their interest, this is against their sovereignty. And then I would like to ask also uh, Vice President Jourova about uh, the case uh, that is ongoing in the Czech uh, Republic with the conflict of uh, interest of uh, the, regarding the Prime Minister. How you see this issue? And in the future, if there is a similar case in Europe, do you think that, that the possibility is there for the European prosecutor to act on this level politically? And also, I would like to ask you when actually you think that the, the rule of law conditionality will work and be effective? Okay. Let's maybe take the questions for Ms. Kirgishi first so that we respect all the corona rules and we don't have to go back and forth. Yeah. So she's okay. Maybe also quickly say who you are. Thank you for your question. I suppose that uh, your question is related to the situation for Slovenia. I have to say that uh, the EPPO has been created to improve the level of protection of the financial interest. And no one can stop EPPO to start, even if one member state did not propose the European delegated prosecutors to be appointed. In my view, this is a lack of sincere cooperation. And uh, this uh, issue undermines the trust in effective functioning of the management and control system for EU in Slovenia. Uh, it has to be said that no one will stop EPPO to work. It will be for us almost impossible to take care of all the cases, but we haven't been set up to allow anyone to put the Slovenian cases in the shelf. I hope I answered your question. Any Thank other you. questions for the Chief Prosecutor? Let me also quickly say for which media you work. Thank you for the question. Usually I comment only what the EPPO is doing. So the European prosecutors were appointed in the procedure and EPPO was not involved in that, so I cannot comment. But I can say that my job as a European chief prosecutor is to be sure that the independence of EPPO will be respected. And until now, I'm sure that all the European prosecutors, all the European delegated prosecutors are independent. I don't have doubts related to this. And we have enough legal guarantees that EPPO will act independently. Maybe you already know that for me, the independence of judiciary, it's very important, and also the independence of EPPO. Any other questions for the chief prosecutor? Yeah. You're in the back, so please speak up. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Can you speak louder, please? <laughs> With the allegation of? The allegations were, or there's allegations of non-EU countries. Non countries. Ah, non-EU countries. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, based on the statistics that we have received from the member states, we estimated that the number of the cases that will be registered in EPPO will be around 3,000 cases. We already today registered a few cases. First case was from Germany, and uh, we also registered cases from Italy. Uh, so we have two situations now. First, we will register the cases that were ongoing in the member states, 
And in those situations, we can evocate those cases. This means that we can take the cases in EPPO and continue the investigation based on some objective criteria. But it's important to say that all the crimes that will be committed after 1st of June 2021 will be in the power of EPPO to be investigated because we have a mandatory uh, jurisdiction. For non-participating uh, member states, we will continue to cooperate with our colleagues prosecutors. We will use the legal instruments that are still uh, used in uh, all the uh, EU countries. I hope our work will convince them to join, but in the end this is a political decision. We are prosecutors, so we cannot comment on this. We started to have a dialogue with all uh, uh, our colleagues from these five non-participating member states, and we already signed a working agreement with Hungary, and I hope soon we will sign with Poland and with the other non-participating member states. Any other questions? So it's obvious that with the new package, there will be a lot of money, more flexibility. This means a higher risk to have more crimes for uh, EPPO. But I don't think this will be the only reason. Uh, also, the fact that EPPO will start the activity, it will be a premise to have more cases. Because for our European delegated prosecutor to investigate this type of fraud will be a priority. I saw that until now it was a huge discrepancies between the member states. In some member states we had only five or six cases per year. In other member states we have hundreds of cases. With EPPO we will change that and it's obvious that the number of the cases will increase. Speaking about this uh, huge amount of money that will be allocated to the member states, our expectation is to have uh, um, some crimes in all the fields, especially in healthcare system, in agriculture, investment, and public procurement. We will investigate only the case that falls under our jurisdiction. If there are some links with these non-participating member states, we can investigate, for example, if a citizen from Poland goes in Romania, let's say, and commits a crime in that moment, and there is a link, in that moment we can investigate also some crimes committed from the non-participating member states, citizens or uh, companies. Otherwise, the national authorities will deal with all these cases. Anyone else? No? Maybe then Surova can take the floor Thank to you very much. Question. Yes, I received two questions from Euronews. Uh, so, as for the conflict of interest uh, of the Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, this is a matter of auditors. This is not a matter of prosecutors. Yeah, so I would not like to mix, mix this up. So this is the ongoing process. The audit of the Commission said clearly that there is the conflict of interest. Now the Czech Republic is considering to take legal steps because they do not agree with that, but it's for the Czech government to reply on that uh, rather than me. On the conditionality, uh, we are uh, intensively working towards the application of this conditionality regulation. Uh, the regulation is in force uh, as of uh, the 1st January this year. So, of course, there are legitimate expectations that the Commission will move uh, towards the application of the, of the conditionality. Uh, we are uh, going to trigger the process uh, after assessing uh, if and which member state would qualify for such process for triggering the procedure, which might end up in uh, freezing part of, of, the, of the funds uh, which uh, is allocated for the respective member state. But the process is mainly in the hands of uh, Johannes, Johannes Hahn, who is the, the boss of the budget. Uh, so we are working hand in hand uh, with, with Johan and uh, my estimation is that we might trigger the process uh, in the second half of, the, of this year. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Ms. Jorova? No? 
I, I, I love it here, so I want to add one, one thing on, on the non-participating countries, uh, especially Poland and Hungary, where the countries who I, I really tried hard to convince to join the EPPO. Uh, and there is, uh, I have to admit, some indirect influence of Poland and Hungary not joining and the conditionality uh, between the rule of law and the budget. Yeah, because we, we saw suddenly the gap is still there. But for non-participating countries, I have to say that still the anti-fraud office, uh, Olaf, uh, will intensively work on, on the cases which, which will be detected in the non-participating member states. But here we see the difference because un, uh, un, uh, while the EPPO has the decision-making power as the first body in the EU, which is, which is what makes EPPO unique, Olaf can only recommend the member states to, to start the, the investigations uh, and prosecution. So that's the difference. Thank you very much. Okay. There's one question that came in from Mr. Renders from the people following remotely, if you don't mind. I didn't hear. <laughs> <laughs> from Slovenian newspaper Delo. Um, it, it relates a bit to what Ms. Jurova has already said, but are the conditions for launching a formal infringement procedure in case of Slovenia already fulfilled? Do you intend to send a letter of formal notice? But we have started, of course, the dialogue with the Slovenian authorities in some time, because like with all the member states participating in the uh, EPPO process, uh, we have asked to have at least uh, the two EDPs appointed for the beginning of the, the process. And uh, uh, till now we have discussions with uh, two uh, member states again, with uh, Finland. I'm hoping that with Finland it will be possible for Finland to come with uh, the appointment of some uh, delegate prosecutors in the next weeks. Uh, I've had also many contacts with the Slovenian authorities at the level of the government to see how it uh, was possible to come with the appointment. Till now, uh, we didn't receive a positive answer. They want to restart the process in Slovenia. So first of all, we'll ask an explanation about why it was uh, important to restart the process. The second element is to ask also to the Slovenian authority how it would be possible to have a very transparent process about the selection for the appointment of the two delegate prosecutors. And I'm hoping that it would be possible to do that very soon because, of course, it was said by the chief prosecutor there are some possibilities to work now with uh, the members of the college uh, here in Luxembourg, but it's just for a transition because uh, it is an obligation to come with uh, the appointment of the uh, EDP. So, of course, if uh, we don't have a positive reaction in the near future, we'll uh, analyze all the possible avenues to force a Slovenian to fulfill the obligations of the regulation. Of course, the way to come back to Luxembourg to another <laughs> Uh, part of the justice uh, European system, it's possible. But for the moment, we are first in discussion with the Slovenian authorities to be sure that they have the capacity to fulfill their obligations in the next weeks and uh, very soon. Uh, if I may still on the question of the nomination of the But first of all, because we have asked a question about the three uh, cases where it was possible for the Council to don't follow the proposal of the panel for the, the College of the Prosecutors, and now there are some procedures here in Luxembourg again uh, before the uh, tribunal for two cases, if I, I were informed. So we will follow that and to see if there were some uh, irregularities or not, because it was uh, the process following the, the regulation. There are discussions also with the member states to see if it's needed in the future uh, to change that. It will be maybe a possibility. I know that there are many discussions on that, but we didn't take a, a decision on this at the commission level for the moment, so we'll continue to engage with the member states. The most important element is to have a very transparent way to organize the selection process and to be sure that it's on the basis of the uh, qualities and the competence of the different candidates that it's possible to make the appointment. And it's the reason why we are not involved in the process for the uh, executive delegate, the, the open delegate prosecutors, like uh, we were not involved in the process at the end. It's a question of the council to de designate the prosecutors, but it's very important to insist on the transparency of the process. It must be possible to verify the situation and if it's needed, 
of course, uh, to have a possibility to, for the candidates uh, to go to a certain jurisdiction, like here for the, uh, to, before the tribunal, to contest uh, the selection. So again, we are in a good way, huh, if, we, if you look to the situation, because if there are some questions, it's possible to challenge that before the court and before here, before the tribunal in Luxembourg. So, no, for the moment we didn't take any decision on, on the possible change, but there are, of course, some reflections on this. And again, uh, certainly for the EDPs, we will ask a very transparent process to be sure that it's possible to have, like it was requested by the Chief Prosecutor, independent, that's the most important element, and qualified, of course, uh, delegate prosecutors. If there are no more okay. questions, we can stop the press conference and there's Thank the opportunity you. for one-on-one -on -one interviews with the different guests.